check, check. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we having a good time? Has everybody had a good time today, this weekend? Thank you. Excellent. Maybe we'll do this again next year about the same time. Maybe a little earlier. I don't know. So uh, uh, we're going to, uh, uh, after the, this talk, we're actually going to have the hotel come in and take all the chairs and tables out and put down some round tables so we can put the chairs back. Tomorrow morning we're having a breakfast where we'll have our award ceremony. It's a breakfast actually sponsored by Tenacity. So if you can come back out and, and uh, we're going to chow down and uh, have some fun, show some pictures, do some things like that. Um, so after the talk, every, when everybody's done, we're just going to kind of file out. After they do that, we're going to probably come back in here since we've got the projector uh, and fire up some videos and goof around, listen to some tunes and everything. We'll see if we can get Al to kick back on the couch and tell some more stories, uh, which means don't bring the kids. But um, other than that, everything seems to be going pretty well. I'm going to step next door uh, and fire up the laser. Uh, I think uh, Adrian wants me to etch the top of his laptop, so we're going to see how much smoke I can create. Define the ruler? No. I didn't look, but, you know, I didn't find it either, so I guess you know, that does qualify. So. But, um, so I'd like to introduce Ben Feinstein. If you don't know Ben, this is Ben. You'll remember him from here on out. Thanks, um, Ben's a security researcher for Dell. That's right. You, know, you don't admit that in a crowd, do you? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of Dell. Oh, I hear you. Uh, Ben's done a lot of talks for me at different cons that uh, I've done over the years, so uh, uh, he's always come out and, and supported us, and I want to say thank you very much for doing so. Thanks. I'm happy to come out. and uh, So the quality of the talk's been really impressive so far. I think it's a going to be a successful event. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Right. So, ladies and gentlemen, Ben Feinstein on the uh, Mordo Combat, which I thought that was an absolutely wonderful <laughs> title. So, thanks a lot. Thanks. Um, so, I, I got to give credit to uh, my buddy, Andre Fresh, who, who couldn't be there, here today, who came up with the witty title. Initially, this was just going to be called Understanding the Morto Worm, but uh, at Security Humor on Twitter, uh, decided to twist it a little bit and came up with something witty for me. So, uh, We've got a, a mix of people here who work in information security, who are makers, hacker spaces, are just generally interested in coming out to events like these. Um, any, a show of hands, anybody who have, has heard of the Morto Worm um, over the past several months besides, besides this talk? All right, so I've got, I've got a little uh, background for y'all. So um, in late August uh, in the security community, people started talking about this new worm that was spreading uh, out on the internet, and it was spreading by brute forcing remote desktop protocol uh, credentials, aka Microsoft Terminal Services, you might know as well. Um, it was named Morto um, as a boulderization of the name Moto, which is what the author of the worm called it itself, if you look in the code. Uh, by brute forcing, it picked a set of usernames and passwords from a dictionary, and it would attempt to find an open RDP service out there on the internet somewhere, it would, and it, when it found an RDP server, it would see if it could log in and establish a session uh, by brute forcing the credentials. Um, the interesting features here is uh, RDP brute force, that's not so interesting, but once it was able to establish an RDP session to the RDP server, it had a pretty interesting way of implanting itself on the remote system that we'll talk about. Um, the command and control mechanism is probably the most interesting part of Morto, and that's really why I picked, uh, picked to talk about this worm. So uh, I was at B-Sides Atlanta yesterday, and I was sitting in the kitchen, and a pretty knowledgeable guy in the security community uh, said, Morto? Well, why are you talking about Morto? That's, that worm was totally lame. It's just guessing you know, a few passwords and, and usernames. Probably only compromised a few thousand machines out there on the internet. You know, wh why, what gives? Why is Morto so interesting? Well, I think Morto, the interesting parts about it is really the command and control mechanisms and the way it implants itself on the compromised machine, not how it, it compromised the, the host initially. So in a sense, Morto uh, and these mechanisms in Morto are really examples of innovation on the part of the attackers out there. Um, them increasing uh, the sophistication of the way they do command and control and the way they implant malware on a system. And it's important that when we see innovation and we see new mechanisms like that, that we, that we look at them and we understand how they work so we can understand how to defend against them and not get caught unawares when something more risky, something more um, dangerous out there adopts these same tactics. So uh, for the audience, 
um, to talk, you know, I'm talking about innovation among botnet command and control mechanisms. So part of it, you ought to talk about the legacy and the history of botnet command and control in general. And this is just a really high level, completely simplified uh, model of how I've seen the progression of malware and botnet command and control over the years. So many years ago, uh, if an attacker compromised a machine and, and installed malware on it, they could directly connect to that machine uh, from the internet. So this is no need for a reverse shell or a reverse connect back or anything like that. These are the days before everybody had a NATing device uh, in front of their internet connection. Days before there was uh, ubiquitous host-based firewalls in every different system. Um, so for example, before Windows XP Service Pack 2 introduced host firewalls, literally you could, um, you know, you're sitting on your cable modem or even your dial-up connection, you're issued an internet routable IP address. Typically that attacker could connect directly to a port that he would open as a listening port on that machine he's compromised. Well, those days are long gone. So uh, botnet operators really moved to IRC as the next step. Um, you know, many people are familiar with IRC as a, as a means to chat and communicate with people, but botnets uh, for many years have used IRC as a mechanism to control issue commands and get, get information back. So these bots would connect, they would be coded to connect to a particular IRC channel or server, join a particular channel, and then uh, these pieces of malware would issue command, they would accept commands from that channel, they would post data back into that channel, and then a botnet operator would just need to join the, the correct IRC channel and they could control their botnet from an IRC window um, or write software to do that in more mechanized fashion. Um, IRC is now uh, less, you know, less usual to see in network traffic, particularly in enterprises or, or corporate environments. Uh, they're typically not going to allow connections outbound on IRC. Um, network security controls these days <coughs> typically look for IRC traffic. It may be a policy violation in some environments. So, what was the giant firewall, you know, hole in the firewall of the past 10 years? It was really HTTP, port 80. Everything is going over port 80. It, it drives right through that firewall. So the botnet operators realized this and they adopted HTTP as their primary uh, mechanism for command and control of these botnets. So essentially the malware is just using HTTP requests, either gets or posts or other uh, methods. Um, the botnet operators set up some web services infrastructure out there receive the commands, they could issue responses back to their uh, botnet and, and basically control them during that mechanism. Uh, the problem there now that is the defenders are wise to it. Everybody's uh, organizations have spent the past years deploying web proxies, network IPSs, you name it, all sorts of security controls that are now inspecting web traffic um, and can detect uh, this kind of command and control channel over HTTP. So the next evolution was a move towards more distributed, more resilient command and control mechanisms. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking was one. So a number of years ago, Stormworm uh, came to the forefront. And Stormworm used a peer-to-peer -peer command and control mechanism where different uh, Stormworm bots would literally connect to each other and exchange commands in a distributed peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, it was very decentralized, it was uh, resilient and hard to take down, but not particularly stealthy. Um, if you're monitoring your network traffic pretty closely, if you're doing some protocol analysis, if you have contemporary security controls deployed, um, peer-to-peer -peer traffic's probably gonna flag some, uh, uh, probably gonna flag some alarms there. It doesn't look like normal network traffic. It doesn't blend in like HTTP would. Um, you know, reports are that Stuxnet also used a peer-to-peer -peer command and control mechanism for some of its uh, work. So we've also seen a evolution on to using DNS for command and control. And I don't mean just using DNS records uh, to map a name to an IP address for the command and control infrastructure, but literally using features of DNS such as uh, TXT resource records that we'll talk more about in a moment to literally uh, issue commands to the bots be able to command the botnet in distributed fashion. So what's happening is the botnet operators are, are reacting to uh, our ability to do takedowns, uh, to block and control their traffic, to detect this kind of traffic. Um, so they've been working and they've been doing innovation to make their command control more resilient, more decentralized, harder to detect, and much harder to distinguish from typical network traffic. 
So uh, DNS TXT records. Um, if you've done network operations or you've done system administration, uh, you, you, you may have worked with DNS servers before. It's incre incredibly scalable and resilient technology. The hierarchical distributed network, um, it just works. It's really one of the part of the one part of the internet architecture that we really got right when, when the internet protocols were designed um, years ago. So typically, an, an advantage of DNS for these botnet operators is it's going to pass right through your firewall and other security controls, typically uninspected. You may have locked down, you know, you block IRC traffic. Uh, all your web traffic has to go through a proxy that inspects it for, for various things. But your DNS, you know, the DNS queries that your hosts issue are going to hit your, their upstream resolver and it's going to basically follow the rules of DNS, either be cached, go to a forward, or do recursive resolution. Um, and it's not typically going to be you know, inspected by an effective security control. You're not typically looking at your DNS queries for things like malware command and control. So um, a little background on DNS. I'm talking about TXT records. Typically, when you resolve a host name to get an IP address back, you're dealing with uh, A records, which are address records or C name records. Um, which make a, another name an alias for another DNS name. A TXT record is a very special DNS resource record type that allows you to store arbitrary data and return arbitrary data. So a, a one TXT record can store up to 60, uh, 64K of information, and each string that's encoded within that record can be up to 255 bytes long. That's a pretty, pretty good amount of data that you can stuff into one of these records. There's no format inherent in it. It's basically an arbitrary data field that can be returned. Um, when I started looking uh, at Morto's use of DNS TXT, um, I wasn't aware of any other malware that it, that had used uh, a mechanism using TXT records. I did some additional research and I was able to uncover a few other examples of malware that was also using this type of DNS record but in a different fashion. So um, back in April of last year, April of 2010, uh, my colleagues in the CTU discovered a new piece of malware that we named Pow Pow. Uh, that was due to a string in one of the DLLs uh, that, that comprised that malware. Um, another researcher uh, recently blogged about it and called it FeederBot. I think that we're talking about the same thing. Um, but it, it used DNS TXT records that were RC4 encrypted. And those RC4 encrypted blobs of information contained the commands that were being issued to the malware. Um, back in June, um, in September, uh, the abuse.ch site, this is the guys that run Spy Eye Tracker and Zeus Tracker um, out, of, uh, uh, out of Switzerland. They wrote a blog in September of 2010 about some malware they first discovered in June 2010. They never named it, we just call it the Unknown Trojan. Uh, that was also using similar mechanisms uh, for command and control. In this case, this piece of malware that the abuse.ch guys reported would literally every few minutes issue a query for a TXT record for the Unix timestamp dot the bad guys domain dot com. So you would see these uh, periodic queries coming out with a Unix timestamp, the epoch time, and then followed by the domain name. And they would get an encoded record back that would contain the commands for the botnet. And so there's been chatter out there uh, over the past year and a half or so about adopting these techniques. So um, here is a screenshot from a forum. Um, a guy goes by the name Jim Halfpenny and has the handle Jim Bob. Um, had posted a blog post with some proof of concept code for how to do command and control using DNS TXT records. And here he is conversing with some other folks. One guy goes by the handle Ketchup and another guy Yats about um, how you could potentially use this technique to control large botnets um, in a distributed fashion without really having to have much in the way of your own infrastructure. Um, the key about not having to have much of your own infrastructure is that all you have to do to control your botnet is update a DNS record in some zone file on the authoritative DNS server or add a record. You don't have to go set up web servers. Or servers. You don't have to register new do domains. Um, all you're doing is updating a DNS zone and the entire DNS infrastructure out there just works like it's designed to and with caching and forwarding and recursive lookups and those bots will get those commands uh, and you, as you sit back and just update a zone file. Um, potentially, you might even be updating a zone file on a DNS server that you'd previously compromised. You may not even have your own DNS server. 
It may not even be a domain that you own. It could be that you compromise a DNS server that's authoritative for some domain and you're just using that as the command and control mechanism. So also I found some additional research, uh, some published research, which is kind of rare in the security world, um, but there was a paper presented um, a couple months ago in Sweden at the European Conference for Computer Network Defense um, uh, by a team of researchers over there, and they had used some statistical methods to analyze large sets of DNS network traffic, and they were able to um, identify several unknown botnets um, from analyzing that set that, that large set of DNS data by using k-mean squared clustering and some other statistical methods. So um, I plan to publish these slides at some, maybe uh, on the sky.com website or, or somewhere else in a blog post. Um, so you can go read up on, on this, these guys' papers. Um, they also published a blog on what they had done around that. So on to Mordo. Um, as I mentioned in uh, August, Morto really emerged and, and hit the forefront and of the security community. Um, we noticed it towards the end of August, and I'll talk a little bit later about looking at the history of Morto. We were able to tell a story about the development of the worm and some testing that had happened early on. <clears throat> so one of the interesting aspects is not the RDP brute force. Um, frankly, it's pretty lame and not effective. And it could be that the botnet, the guy who created this, didn't really want it to be a global massive worm um, like we saw with Code Red or Nimda or SQL Slammer or things of that nature because it would have gotten him too much of the wrong kind of attention. I suspect that Morto was really a research project for somebody that was exploring these techniques um, and wanted to deploy it to the wild um, but not cause so much damage that uh, the hammer would have gotten dropped on them. So Morto's architecture is around an implant and a stub. The implant actively scans the network for RDP services, essentially just port scanning for uh, 3389 that's open. And when it finds an open RDP server, it goes and does its brute force uh, attempts. Um, if it's successful, it's able to establish a session in the RDP server, um, it copies a stub DLL, which the author called the loader, to the remote system and launches that DLL with the run DLL32 command. Um, that stub, uh, first it checks if it's running within run DLL32, probably to hamper malware analysis. So you can't just load up this DLL um, without running it within that, that context. <coughs> And it looks in a particular location and finds that encoded and compressed copy of the implant. So I learned something new when I was digging into Morto that literally over an RDP session, you can map Windows network shares um, within that RDP session. So when an RDP client connects to an RDP server, there's a network share created called slash slash TS client. What, the Morto, what a Morto infected host does is it creates a virtual A drive under the TS client network share and it creates a file in that virtual A drive called Moto. That file is actually an encoded and compressed copy of the implant itself. So once it, once it compromises that remote machine, um, it basically, that remote machine gets access to a copy of the worm itself based on the, the network share that the client's published. So it's a, it's a little bit reversed. You've got the compromised machine that's acting as an RDP client but it's serving up a network share um, and a virtual A drive shared over that RDP session to the victim, which is actually an RDP server. So the stub looks in that TS client slash A slash Moto and finds that copy of the implant. It then decodes and uncompresses and executes that implant. Um, the way it actually persists across reboots and stays on the system is to do service hijacking. Um, it picks one of four different uh, Windows services to hijack, it copies its DLL, um, copies its DLL over the shared services DLL, does basically a preloading attack in that fashion, and that's how it's going to persist across multiple reboots. Here's the picture of the dictionary um, that it uses. It basically just iterates through all the different combinations of usernames and passwords. Um, if it gets one right, it, it wins. If not, it just moves on. 
There's 925 combinations, um, 25 usernames and 37 passwords that it attempts. So again, not, not uber elite stuff. This is just a, a pretty basic brute force attack. Uh, but it was successful enough to compromise a few thousand machines at least. Um, and again, I think the author behind this didn't actually intend for this to be a massively successful, to grow like a million node botnet based on this worm. But rather, he wanted a controlled, he wanted to test this in the wild, but in a relatively controlled fashion to prove some concepts and to explore some ideas he had. The only name that really jumped out at me that I looked into was that support underscore 388945A0 account. And at first, you know, I was like, well, what is that? Why would a worm try to authenticate with that username? But doing some Google searches, it turns out that the Windows Help and Support Service actually creates that account and it uses that account uh, when it executes signed scripts within the Windows Help pages. Um, by default, access is denied for that user, but potentially um, somebody could have gone in with administrative privileges and, and added rights to it. So basically, I think the author said, well, I'm, I'm just about guaranteed this account will exist, but 99 times out of 100, it's going to be turned off, but that's good enough for his purposes. So we talked about uh, the initial infection and how it actually uh, implants itself on the system. Um, it also stores a copy of itself uh, within the Windows registry. So that Moto file that's shared via the terminal services client network share in the virtual A drive, that's written in the registry as well. So it always has a copy of the implant. Um, it, it, uh, as I mentioned, it, it basically launches regedit, um, or rather sends keystrokes, launches regedit, uh, does pre -LL, DLL preloading where it's gonna load its own DLL and then load the actual legitimate DLL after it's executed its own code. Um, service hijacks one of these four services to persist. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the registry stuff uh, in a slide here, but um, it creates a registry key, that WPA under uh, HKEY local machine system. And a quick way to, to get rid of the persistence of Morto is to delete the MD key under that registry uh, and reboot. So um, I need to take the opportunity to give credit where credit's due to the, the CTU malware analysis team that, that tore this thing apart, um, that wrote our internal report and that we shared with our intelligence services customers. Um, that's where we found this kind of information, this level of detail. So here's the different registry values that Morto uses and what we believe they're used for. Um, a couple of them remain unknown. We're not quite sure what they're there for. Um, as I mentioned, the MD key, that's actually the binary uh, contents of the implant. Uh, it has a, generates a UUID and writes that to a registry value. It takes a timestamp of when it was first infected, um, records a record of which service it chose to hijack when it was installed. Um, there's an updating timestamp in there. One of the keys, uh, every so often, it updates it to the timestamp. Um, the IF key is interesting. The, the botnet controller can uh, cause commands to be executed on the bots. And so part of the sequence of making that happen is it actually writes the command, the path of the program that's going to be executed into that registry key. And then later on, it calls shell execute on the contents of that registry key. And then CMD, we'll, uh, in a few slides, we'll actually talk about the encoded TXT records that it uses. The encoded records get written into that key. So if you've ever done uh, queried for DNS TXT records, it's commonly used for SPF or sender protected from, which is a, a technology to defeat spam where organizations can publish a list of net blocks that are authorized to send email on their behalf for their domain. So up top you'll see if you, if you query for the TXT record for Dell, you'll see there's a list of different net blocks um, that are authorized to send email on behalf of the Dell.com domain. But when we looked at some of the command and control domains that Morto was using, we got back encoded responses like below. Now, uh, there's another technology called Domain Keys Identified Mail, or DKIM. Uh, you also see a blob of encoded data in there, but it has some, some metadata about it. It'll say that here's a DKIM key, and it's a SHA-1 hash, and et cetera, et cetera. So you don't really see, typically, TXT records that are just a big encoded blob. Uh, so when we first saw this, we kind of scratched our head and uh, didn't know what quite to make of it. So 
onto, onto uh, static analysis and reverse engineering. Um, so uh, using IDA Pro and some other tools, we tore apart the, the sample um, and found the code that actually was doing the decoding of these records once they were received. Um, it's not really intended for you to be able to make out the machine code here, um, but the malware analyst in question, Ross Kinder, um, who works for us, transcribed that sequence, that function that he found the code into a very short Python script that we're then able to use. Um, given that Python script, we were able to basically uh, mine the DNS, pull all these encoded records out for various different command and control names, run them through our secret decoder ring, and get a decoded blob. And so you can see that message up top actually decodes to a URL. HTTP colon slash slash a, a bare IP address slash 160.rar. And so what this command is actually telling, in this case, Morto to do is go fetch a file called 160.rar from this remote website and, and run it and install it as a module. So we um, were able to tell more of a story about Morto. Once we figured out how to decode these things, and once we figured out sort of a pattern to how these records were encoded, we went back through a passive DNS database and we wanted to find all, all resolutions in the passive DNS database for TXT records that had an answer that matched this sort of pattern. So a passive DNS database, uh, what passive DNS is, is some organizations have great visibility into the global DNS traffic. The Internet Software Consortium, or ISC, is one of those organizations. And so if you, for example, um, operate a root, uh, one of the root DNS servers, um, typically you, you monitor all the DNS resolutions and you shove it into a database with timestamps. And so um, what some organizations have access to, including Dell SecureWorks, is basically a historical record from the vantage point of, say, one of the root DNS servers of every single resolution and the answer that, that occurred across that root server. So what we did is look through all the TXT records that we could find and look for answers that matched the sort of encoding that we found. And we were able to find 155 domain names total, many of which no one really knew about. There was you know, a handful of domain names that had been that Morto was using actively when it was spreading in the wild at the end of August or early September. But we found this guy's uh, test domains. So whoever was behind Morto, he started testing it in June 20, uh, 2011. He was doing some experiments. We found unrelated domain names that had published TXT records that used the Morto encoding algorithm. Right about mid-August, it appeared that he reconfigured his domain names uh, for deployment. So he's preparing to deploy Morto to the wild. And then um, right as it sort of hit the security blogosphere and all the security researchers were talking about it around August 28th, um, the botnet operator added some additional C2 servers, uh, possibly uh, to make it more difficult to take down the ones he was already using. Because there, there were already takedown um, uh, processes that were getting played out at that time. So here uh, from um, Internet Storm Center, their D-Shield, I think it is. You know, there's a huge uptick in probes out there on the Internet for port 3389, which is the RDP port. Um, there, was a couple, there was a spike you know, in earlier August, a spike right in mid-August, and then a tremendous uptick uh, towards late August. And th this is basically port scans for port 3389 on a global, on a global level. So to quantify a little bit uh, the impact of Morto, like I said, it was pretty lame. It wasn't successful if your definition of success was, you know, building a million node botnet. Um, this is from the Microsoft Malware Protection Center. Um, they were comparing the volume of detections they saw um, on August 17th between Saudi, IRC bot, and Morto. And you can see there was probably only like a thousand Morto detections that day. So not, not a real massive global threat out there. And then they were looking at, uh, broke down by the operating system of uh, the host that reported the infection. This is, these are systems that are running, say, Microsoft Security Essentials or, or uh, uh, one of their AV products. And the majority of them are Windows XP. I don't have the market share numbers off the top of my head, but I think that this is 
disproportionately representative XP versus the actual population of XP boxes out there in the real world. It sort of makes sense a little bit that an organization that would have uh, an internet accessible RDP service with a password like password probably isn't like you know updated to Windows 7 just yet. They might be um, more negligent and less uh, cutting edge or, or less up to date on their IT operations than uh, an organization that has strong password policies and has firewall rules to restrict access to these things. So I pulled um, some of uh, the SecureWorks alert data um, of what we were seeing across our sensor grid. Uh, this is based on about 3,400 IDS sensors uh, around the world that we monitor and uh, manage um, and that, we, that the CTU pushes rules to and writes custom rules for. So this is, uh, this is sort of a generic detection that was pretty effective where we wrote a snort rule that looks for DNS answers that have a, a TXT record in them that matches sort of the encoding pattern that Morto uses. Um, not really any appreciable level of false positives in here. Um, and you can see that uh, in September there was some real volume and then it's tapered off in October. Um, so we observe active Morto infections across uh, a handful of our customers, um, some in the financial space, some in the healthcare space. Um, one of the most interesting and the best source of data even to this day when I was like pulling more data on, on Thursday night um, was the network of a large ISP that we monitor um, and that still has Morto infections traversing their network to this day. It's not ISP, not systems that belong to the ISP that are compromised but rather that the ISP has a number of customers that still have active Morto infections. Um, I, I can't argue with them. The ISP's position is that it's not their job to go do remediation on their customers' systems. Um, you know, as if, like Comcast, it's not their job to go, like, clean a virus off your system. Uh, the ISP merely transits traffic. But it's a great source of data for us because we've still got you know, Morto worm samples that we can observe their DNS TXT records um, actively, even to this day. And then here is um, another little tidbit where Morto sends a beaconing packet um, over various different ports, and the packet starts with um, six bytes, M-O-T-O-S space, uh, with those capitalizations, actually. So we, we deployed a real basic snort rule that looks for a packet outbound um, that's below a, a pretty small size that starts with the first six bytes of MOTOS space. Uh, this has been a pretty effective detection. Not a lot of false positives out there. Um, and this, this mechanism isn't being used by all the bots, so we didn't see a whole lot of hits on it, but we de detected it at, at a number of organizations over time. So obviously, like, like any piece of malware, there's, a, there's actually a human being or a team of human beings that's behind this thing, and they're reacting and they're adjusting their tactics as the security community um, reacts to them. So there's been some changes that occurred over time to Morto. So the RDP brute force mechanism, uh, they pushed an update out to the malware and removed that. So it's not actively propagating anymore. Um, this also might suggest that this was an experiment that's run its course, and the guy or gal behind it is not interested in continuing this experiment anymore. The TXT uh, C2 mechanism, they pushed down an update, and Morto worms that were able to receive that update um, aren't using that command and control mechanism anymore. So it's as if he's shutting down parts, he's shutting down functionality in parts of the botnet. He's not really interested in growing it anymore. Um, and then the only, the, another interesting thing we observed is um, some interaction with a website called 345zx.com. So when we first observed this, I was looking through a packet dump uh, from a customer who was um, remediating, remediating an infection. And we saw, we, we saw what we thought was a denial of service attack hitting an IP address out there. And the IP address was in China. And I thought it was a DOS because it was high volume. It kept trying to connect out to it. Uh, and it was also, so it would connect on TCP 80, but it was also throwing UDP packets to port 80 on that IP address. Not sure why. Um, and so initially we speculated that maybe this thing, because we knew it had denial of service capabilities, you could issue a command to it to tell it to go DOS a website. 
maybe it was DOSing this website. And so we went through our passive DNS database with that IP address. And the nice thing about having a passive DNS database is I can tell you what names map to that IP address. And so quickly we discovered that 345ZX was the website that mapped to that IP address. Um, as the plot thickened a little bit, this, this website is a Chinese language site for the massively multiplayer online game called uh, Zhiwan. I'm not pronouncing it right. I don't have my colleague Wei in the audience to correct me today at, like I did yesterday at B-Sides. Um, but uh, uh, this MMOPG has uh, various server emulation, emulators. What a server emulator is, it's an unauthorized instance of the server back end so you can play the game uh, without a subscription. So imagine, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't play WoW, but if there's a various, you know, rogue servers out there where you can go play WoW without uh, using uh, battle.net or Blizzard's servers. Um, so probably not actually a DOS attack. What I think actually it was is the customer had already blocked um, access on their firewall from the infected host. So it was just hammering on the firewall trying to connect. Probably a little bit of sloppy coding or, you know, it didn't, didn't uh, back off, it didn't have any sort of back off capability. It was just trying to connect to that thing. Can't really ex explain the port 80 UDP packets we saw other than sloppy coding or something. I wouldn't see why they'd expect to get an HTTP service on UDP port 80. And here's a screenshot from that uh, website and it lists all these different server emulators for this game. Um, and if you actually see the worm and observe the worm interact with the website, it parses through the index page of the page um, and looks for uh, form submissions. It's almost as if it's trying to crack a capture. We're not quite sure. But it, it's in, it actually interacts with the web page and follows some links and then parses through the index pages. So one of the keys is uh, the finishing moves from Morto. How, how do you remediate this? How do you mitigate it? Um, how do you detect it? So when prevention fails, and prevention will fail, how are you going to detect it and, and get rid of it? So from a uh, prevention and mitigation perspective, let's start with the basics. Enforce a strong password policy. Uh, you saw the usernames and passwords this thing attempts. It, it, these aren't strong passwords. It only uses like uh, 30 some odd different passwords. Organizations that had enforced a strong password policy on their RDP servers never would have had a problem. It's pretty easy to do in a Windows domain environment. Um, uh, a next one is network access controls, right? You probably, you probably don't have a good reason to expose an RDP service to the internet. Some, some organizations may have a business need for it. Um, you probably ought to require VPNing in your network before you start running RDP services. But, you know, every business is different, every organization is different. Um, but you ought to consider restricting network access to your RDP services from untrusted net blocks. There's a lot you can do um, in terms of monitoring authentication failures. So you could detect if you're getting brute forced um, by either monitoring the Windows event log off your RDP servers, um, you know, pulling into some sort of SIM solution or log monitoring solution, or from a network perspective, um, pretty much any IDS worth its salt is going to be able to detect RDP authentication failures and apply some sort of thresholding logic to that. Um, one advantage for an IDS in that sense is that you can also monitor outbound. So literally when we, when we rolled out detections for this, um, if we saw a brute force inbound, just failed authentications, that was a lower severity event than when we saw it outbound. Because if you think about it, if you've got an RDP server on the internet, that's just your business, that's how you're configured, every once in a while someone's going to try to brute force it. And you ought to be notified, that's an alert. But if you see one of your systems on the network hammering away at a remote RDP server, say in another country or somewhere else, that means you've got an active infection on your network and that's a much higher uh, severity event. That means you've got an incident underway versus you're getting brute forced. There's a chance that that might turn into an incident if you have a weak password policy. Um, so being able to look for it outbound is important as, as well. Monitor your DNS infrastructure. Apply DNS watch listing. Um, monitor DNS query logs and, and suck them into a SIM solution. Uh, configure your network security controls like IDSs and IPSs to apply DNS watch listing to the network. Um, one of the, the keywords you might start hearing more over the coming year is DNS firewall. This is 
just a buzzword um, to sell more security control products now, apparently. What they really mean is DNS reputation. Um, there's a pretty cool technology uh, that Paul Vixie started talking about maybe a year ago called DNS RPZ or DNS Response Policy Zones. It's an extension of the DNS protocol to allow um, your resolver, your organization's resolver, to fetch DNS reputation data um, using the DNS protocol from organizations that publish DNS reputation. Um, so keep your eye on that, DNS RPZ. Uh, there's a few organizations that pr provide DNS reputation via that protocol. Um, the newest versions of Bind support it out of the box. You can also um, install an add-on to Bind that allows it to query for DNS reputation. And by reputation, I mean that if you know we were able to publish watch list of all the domain names we knew to be associated with Morto Command and Control. And if you saw a host on your network request a TXT record from one of those names, that's a pretty strong indicator of compromise out there. So when prevention fails, you're left with detection. Um, the network firewall. If you're monitoring your firewall logs, there's plenty you can do with it. If you watch repeated outbound attempts for RDP services out there, that's a pretty strong indicator of compromise. You've got a system on your machine that's launching brute force attacks against remote systems. You ought to do something about that. From a network IDS perspective, um, we wrote rules, as I mentioned, that look for specially encoded TXT records um, in DNS answers. So when you see that, that means that you it's a pretty strong indicator of compromise. You've got a machine on your system that's requesting TXT records from known from domains that have published them with that particular encoding. Pretty suspicious. Um, just looking, you know, applying DNS watchlisting or DNS reputation in terms of IPS signatures, looking for queries to those known bad domains. Um, we also had some detections out there for that Moto S packet that I mentioned that you'd see the worm send out now and then, as well as um, we were actively mining the DNS data that we're seeing. So we had this feedback loop going from our RDS signatures. We'd write signatures for these encoded TXT records, and then we were parsing them out and finding the IPs and URLs that were the commands for the bots, and then turning those into additional signatures. So we had, say, a signature that looked for an HTTP request for 160.rar. And we knew that the bots would do that because we just saw them get a command down there. And this would help in some environments we may not have had visibility into the DNS segment. Um, we may have only been sitting, say, in front of a web proxy or behind a web proxy. So it's additional detection capabilities that we're able to roll out there. And then from a host-based indicators of compromise perspective, there's a lot you could have done with Morto. Um, the registry keys I mentioned, um, so what do I mean by host-based indicators of compromise? So there's a number of vendors out there that'll, that have products to instrument all your endpoints, all your hosts in your network, and allow you to really rapidly look for indicators of compromise in terms of the names of processes, uh, DLL injection, pro or process injection rather, service hijacking, the names or patterns of different mutexes on the system, if they're open ports, um, if there are connections that have been established to particular IP addresses or net blocks. Um, so this is what I mean by host indicators of compromise. If you had one of these products deployed out there to your endpoints, you could have immediately said, well, go look for a registry key called WPA under HQ local machine, uh, whatever. And you, know, you would have gotten back results. Oh, there's two boxes in the UK that have been popped. Let me go respond. Um, also, it created a 532 byte shared memory segment with a particular name. So again, knowing this, you can go look across your entire enterprise if you're instrumented properly and look for, hey, of the 50,000 desktops in my giant organization, um, do any of them have a mutex called global slash moto share? Oh, the two boxes over here do. Let me go respond to that. So again, um, to summarize, Moto, I mean, uh, Morto worm itself wasn't, you know, some badass kind of worm. It didn't impact, it didn't make the internet melt down. It wasn't popping boxes left and right. But it did illustrate some pretty interesting capabilities around how it actually infected a machine after it got that RDP session, but particularly how it was using DNS TXT records for command and control. Um, I think it's important that we learn from every, everything we can in the security community. Um, the lessons learned from this are that you ought to be monitoring your DNS. You need to be instrumented to look for host indicators of compromise and look for diff different kind of anomalous DNS 
um, traffic out there. The next major threat might come along and it might not have a nice simple signature that you can write for it. Um, if you haven't instrumented properly, then you're going to have a hard time dealing with it. So the bad guys are learning from all this just like we are. The next you know, Code Red or NIMBD out there might actually use a more sophisticated version of this sort of command and control mechanism. So it's important, like, think in your own organization, if, you do, if you're a security professional, do you have the ability to look for particular encodings of DNS answers on the wire? Do you, are you logging all your DNS queries? Can you apply DNS reputation and watch listing um, across the enterprise? Do you have instrumentation in place um, to look for these kind of indicators? Uh, now's the time to plan and get ahead of it. It's about uh, 7.30. Um, we're wrapping up at the end of the time. I'd be happy to answer any questions we got out here. Yeah. Did you ever have any indication of the uh, geographical source? Okay, um, so the question was, was there any indication of the geographical source or actor attribution for Morto? Um, no. Uh, I would love to find out what patient zero was. How did it initially get started? Um, just putting on my black hat, you know, if I was going to release a worm like that, I might start it with some infrastructure I had previously compromised. Um, you know, go find some vulnerable systems, pop them, and then start the worm there. Um, I probably wouldn't like, you know, start it from my home internet connection. Um, but I don't know where patient zero was. Um, there's a, some very you know, circumstantial evidence um, connecting it to China, the Chinese language based on its interactions with that 345ZX website and the interest in that um, Chinese language uh, massively multiplayer online game. But that's very circumstantial, so uh, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, Carlo? What about any intel gathered from all of the domains that were registered? Uh, yeah, that's a good, I, I, I failed to mention that part. Um, so the, the who is information, the registra registration information for those domains um, uh, had, uh, they're registered with addresses in Hong Kong and some other places in Asia. Um, the names sounded Asian, whatever that means, right. but um, who is registration, it's an, another uh, piece of circumstantial evidence. Um, but it, yeah, they, they did have um, some Hong Kong or China connection in the who is data. Right. So to repeat the question, um, do you think the the small dictionary and the, the relatively low level brute force, maybe the attacker, their thinking was that, well, the same organizations that have really weak passwords on an internet facing servers probably don't have security controls in place and you're going to be able to persist in their environment for much longer. That's an interesting way to conceive of it. Um, the two would seem correlated, right? If you're, you're sitting there with your pants around your ankles, you probably don't have a lot of ways to defend yourself either. <laughs> Any other questions? Thanks for staying so late. I know the last talk of the day, it's been a long day for everybody. We dr just drove up here from Atlanta this afternoon and we're real happy to be able to join everybody at the first, uh, hopefully the first of many different Skydog cons. Um, just give an opportunity to give thanks to uh, Trevor and all the volunteers, um, the people that are doing the AV, uh, taping it, um, they're taking their time out of their weekend to come here and make this all possible. Appreciate it.